Hello and welcome to the President's Class, now solely on YouTube for the pandemic. Thank you for joining us for our ongoing series, Seeking Wisdom in Troubled Times. We hope you are safe and well. Whoever fights monsters should see to it that in the process he does not become a monster. And if you gaze long enough into an abyss, the abyss will gaze back at you. That is Friedrich Nietzsche. So far in this series, we have examined stories changing, new stories emerging, and how truth changes with the medium and motivation of its tellers. In the first lecture, I mentioned that our favorite monster was born during a shelter at home event in 1816, when teenage Mary Shelley wrote the novel Frankenstein as part of a storytelling contest. Catastrophic events shake loose such imaginative creatures. So it is a good time now to follow up on monsters and what they do to us and for us. Let us begin with etymology, since it is the study of words, specifically the meanings we have made of words over time, and that can get us to a deeper history of the concept. Monster comes from the Latin monstrum, meaning portent, and from monere, meaning to warn. It is the same root that we find in the English word demonstrate. We see that from the very beginning, then, we have used the word to mean a bad omen. Monsters tell us that something is terribly wrong with our world and that destruction is imminent. Just what is being destroyed is the subject of this talk. Consistent with that function of monsters is that their composition is usually hybrid and outsized. Warning signs must be different from other signs. Sirens must be flashing red. Monsters must look different than other creatures to draw our attention. As is so often the case, Dr. Frankenstein's monster is emblematic, consisting as he does of different body parts integrated into an excessive and frightening scale. And that is our common definition of monster, something hideous and uncanny that produces fear. There is a lot to explore and learn here. And to lead us through the fascinating study of monsters, I will be relying on Jeffrey Jerome Cohen's essay, Monster Culture, Seven Theses. Cohen is a medievalist and is engaging some high theoretical concepts within cultural studies, history, and philosophy, some of which I will translate for you. But I want to use this general outline for an exploration of monsters that is accessible and relevant to the pandemic. His goal is the same of his goal is the same as ours, reading cultures from the monsters they engender. And the use of seven theses is a terrific entree into a difficult subject. In fact, he calls his essay a monster itself in that it is a series of fragments rather than smooth epistemological holes, an unassimilated hybrid, a monstrous body. Let us face our monster today, COVID-19, through an understanding of monster theory and culture. One of the greatest obstacles for seekers, and everyone for that matter, is literalism. The inability to see the sacred and esoteric dimension that everyday symbols are pointing toward. We may recall the great Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh's teaching about mistaking the finger pointing at the moon for the moon itself. And he is drawing upon the teaching of the Diamond Sutra, which describes the teaching itself as a raft to take you across the water. Once you arrive to the other side of the river, 
a raft is no longer needed, nor is it appropriate for travel on land. In fact, a raft actually becomes a burden to carry at that point. We all make this mistake often since we live and breathe language, not the moon, and through sheer repetition and inertia. We can incarnate our monsters as real instead of looking for what they demonstrate, what they are pointing toward. Of course, that is easier said than done when a symbol generates fear and loathing, as monsters do. Just as in our favorite emotion, love, intense feelings turn us toward the immediate and physical rather than the esoteric and sublime. Facing and overcoming our overwhelming fear is one of the challenges of dealing with monsters. There are many more. So while we are relatively safe watching this video, let us understand the first thesis of monster culture. The monster's body is a cultural body. The first thesis is already liberating. This thing that is terrifying us is symbolic and semiotic. Our monster is a sign, which means that we conjured it, so it belongs to us. Of course, the novel coronavirus is deathly real, and one does not die from a symbol. Those who are infected are suffering from a medical condition, and their experience is different from that of monster culture in general. The body in pain and distress is its own experience, one worth an examination in its own right. For those of us who are not experiencing symptoms, however, the novel coronavirus exists in culture, not in our bodies. It is mediated and therefore lives in symbolic systems like language and images. Theorist Jean Baudrillard was criticized for his serial work, The Gulf War Did Not Take Place, published in The Guardian in 1991. But he was right then, and his point is relevant now with COVID-19. He knows the Gulf War took place for people who fought and died, but his point is the same as mine here. That is, unless we were there, we cannot access such events outside of a system of signification. And perhaps even if we are there, but that's a deeper and different conversation. His argument is that most people experienced the Gulf War through a mediated channel, specifically a literal cable channel, CNN, and the United States government's curated words, and imagery. The same is true for most of us now in regard to the novel coronavirus. First of all, we cannot actually see the virus with the naked eye. We see graphic representations and read linguistic descriptions. Moreover, the meanings we attach to these symbols are cultural. We interpret them in light of existing stories and meanings. Or even if we attempt to create new interpretations, the material we use is already here in existing words and symbols. Because the monster's body is a cultural body, we have some control over our reactions to it and to the monster itself. We created it so we can kill it. And we have thousands of novels and films that show us doing just that with our other monsters. We might also add that our monster is made of collective psychic energy, specifically anxiety and fear. These are the emotions that arise when our stories begin to fail, when our maps are no longer adequate for the territory. A previously unaccounted for phenomenon, like a new virus, creates uncertainty, which generates anxiety and fear. This uncertainty increases and in turn builds up the negative emotions associated with it like a storm cloud. What we need is release, or what Freud termed cathexis, 
the transfer of energy to an external object or symbol. We conjure monsters to represent all of the sphere and to receive this pent-up emotion like a lightning rod. As we already noted, we construct this monster out of language and symbol, that is, existing stories and their elements, only in new proportions and relations. That process itself is monstrous. As Cohen notes, the monster's body quite literally incorporates fear, desire, anxiety, and fantasy, giving them life and an uncanny independence. The monster then reflects its own hybridity by using the fragments of our existing stories, maps, and symbols. Monsters are created to be read. They demonstrate. There are fingers pointing at the moon if the moon were coming to kill us. Further, monsters live in the liminal zone, emerging in crisis and disappearing in calm. Monsters are us, specifically our psychological and cultural projections, and the monster's body is a cultural body. We are now already deep into monster culture. If we accept that the monster's body is cultural, then several other insights follow. For example, if monsters are us and are conjured from a perceived catastrophe pending or already here, then monsters can never be killed. Yet monsters must always be killed. Our uncertainty and the intense emotions that it fosters is not only unsustainable, it is unbearable. For us to survive, the monster must die. But for us to live in an ever-changing world, the monster must reappear in its old form or a new one. Cohen puts it this way for his second thesis of monster culture. The monster always escapes. If we could ask Ripley, in Alien or Sarah Connor in Terminator or any of the characters in the hundreds of Dracula or Frankenstein retellings, they would agree with the second thesis. Monsters are revenants. They always return because we always need them and ultimately because they are us. In fact, with certain monsters like vampires or Terminators, their inability to be killed is their main monstrous feature. Monsters return to embody our newest fears, our deepest anxieties, and the mad uncertainty of the liminal zone. But when they return, they are made of contemporary cultural signs and symbols reflecting current concerns. For example, literary critic Nina Auerbach rightly notes that the novel Dracula is a compendium of end-of-century phobias, sex, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, technology, and language. Francis Ford Coppola was working on a documentary about AIDS at the same time as his feature film, Bram Stoker's Dracula. In fact, and consistent with every monster's hideous hybridity, Stoker's novel itself is anything but whole and uniform. The text itself is stitched out of old technology, like diary entries, transcriptions from this new technology called audio recording, and existing media like newspapers. It is made of fragments of new and old that have not been integrated into a new story, but reflect the disintegration of the old one. The result is a chaotic and kaleidoscopic experience of the characters, which Coppola captures well in his film. As Cohen puts it in regard to monster theory, monstrous interpretation is as much process as epiphany, a work that must content itself with fragments, footprints, bones, talisman, teeth, shadows, obscured glimpses, signifiers of monstrous passing that stand in for the monstrous body itself. 
COVID-19 is a revenant as well, calling attention to our persistent concerns about conspiracies, race, politics, and technology. These are the fragments Cohen references, footprints of old stories and ideologies that were monstrous themselves and that they appeared in other times of crisis and were hybrids pieced together out of our fear and loathing. As I mentioned in our first lecture, our catastrophes began before COVID-19. So our monsters were already stirring from their lairs. Now they are appearing in the daylight of our media and public discourses and are eager to feed upon our fear. We feed them well and they grow accordingly. What exactly engenders such fear when a monster appears? Not surprisingly, it is something ancient and primal in the human psyche and something we have engaged in terms of story already. As fragile human beings existing in a web of relation, we need order. We need the world to stand still for a moment so that we can put it into boxes. The universe itself does not provide for such ordering, at least in terms that are comforting to us. It shows us chaos, collision, and ephemerality, and any order we put upon it is ours alone, made of language and consisting of projections of our desires. That process is also our very existence and survival to order the world in some way that not only makes sense to us, but also allows us to survive and thrive. As well as Stevens put it, this is a blessed rage for order. And it is indeed both blessed and a rage. We have been casting this phenomenon in terms of story or myth, but it also appears in philosophy, science, and culture as order, which is made of categories. When a monster appears, it is the harbinger of a category crisis, a threat to order, which is Cohen's third thesis. Again, the monster itself embodies all these theses, this one in particular by being a hybrid that is constructed of multiple categories that do not belong together. As we saw in the anomalous deck of cards experiment, we react poorly to category bleeding or disintegration, and it can create disgust and horror. Cohen cites Harvey Greenberg on the hybrid composition of the monster in the film Alien. It is a Linnaean nightmare, defying every natural law of evolution by turns bivalve, crustacean, reptilian, and humanoid. It seems capable of lying dormant within its egg indefinitely. It sheds its skin like a snake, its carapace like an anthropod. It deposits its young into other species like a wasp. It responds according to Lamarckian and Darwinian principles. Creatures that do not fit threaten the existing order of things, that is, the world as we have constructed it through our categories. Much of our early education involves learning and reinforcing the order of things, such as when we are asked in an exam, which one of these things is unlike the other? The unstated premise of that exercise is that the world is ordered and that our well-being consists in aligning ourselves to that order and making sure that everything stays in its place. You may already be recognizing how such thinking is far from neutral and in fact involves a veiled power dimension where the distinctions apply to people and cultures. In fact, racist ideologies reach for the monster trope first when describing peoples deemed to be inferior. And it is easier to justify genocide when we define the victims as monsters themselves, if only because they are unlike the others. 
we can find blessed rage for order and religion as well. In fact, in our last lecture, we explored how the muthos of Jesus was transformed into the logos of Christ as an attempt to order Christianity through doctrine and dogma. In her brilliant work, Purity and Danger, an analysis of the concepts of pollution and taboo, anthropologist Mary Douglas argues that such a rage for order is behind the seemingly inscrutable dietary laws of the ancient Hebrews, as well as other cultures that have a concern with dirt or pollution, which is by definition outside the order of things. You may recall that the laws given to the Hebrews who had finally entered the promised land were both strict and seemingly bizarre. Unclean were animals that do not chew the cud and do not have cloven hoofs, fish without fins and scales, the blood of any animal, shellfish, and all other living creatures that creep and certain birds. Douglas argues quite convincingly that these laws emerge not from some nascent community health instinct, nor from Yahweh's arbitrary commands. Rather, they come from a specific understanding of the sacred as that which is whole, undifferentiated, and in its place, according to the original order of creation. The profane, then, is that which is fragmented, hybrid, and or out of place. She writes, Holiness means keeping distinct the categories of creation. It therefore involves correct definition, discrimination, and order. Accordingly, Jewish law was comprehensive and reflected Judaism itself at the time. There was a concern to keep the chosen people separate from the non-chosen people, which accounts for strident rules against intermarriage with other tribes. This blessed rage for order fits perfectly with injunctions against worshiping other neighboring gods. The concern with what was coming into and out of the body, food, menstrual blood, semen, was reflected in the concern with what was coming into and out of the society. People outside of the society were other, and intercourse, both physical and discursive, was either strictly regulated or outright prohibited. Animals that were considered hybrid were unclean, as were women during menstruation and men who had had nocturnal emissions. My list here is shortened for our purposes, but we should note that what is clean and unclean, what fits and does not fit, must be cataloged exhaustively, as it is in the Torah. It is probably worth mentioning here, too, that the most cited prohibitions against homosexuality, right up to the present, come out of this scheme. Though adherents of that particular proscription never follow the others in the scheme and freely eat of the unclean animals and partake in other behaviors explicitly listed there. And of course, we should mention that Jews themselves would become victims of this process over time culminating in the Shoah, Nazi Germany's final solution to its monster problem. Had the Nazis understood Nietzsche Instead of appropriating him, they might have learned from his warning about looking for monsters and becoming one in the process. COVID-19 has already wrecked our ordered world, and it is just beginning. Categories once thought solid and sound are changing and even disintegrating before our eyes. Work, social life, death and dying, Economics, politics, travel, love, popular and high culture, and more. We are right to be frightened at such deep structural change. We are wrong 
to make monsters out of our pre-existing enemies or others because it is not their fault. While people certainly fail us, it is the failing of our collective ordering that engenders monsters. The human and humane response is to open ourselves to a new order, a new story, and to construct it with a recognition of our delicacy and strength instead of our anxiety and fear. And we will come back to this at the end. Every culture has some kind of ordering at work, but it is our rage for order itself that creates what is unclean, taboo, and monstrous. We attempt to erect permanent and binding structures of difference in a world that is constantly changing. And when those creations are shaken, a monster appears to remind us that there are worlds outside of our ordered world, worlds beyond our words. Or as Cohen puts it, the monster is the harbinger of a category crisis. I might want to go further and suggest that the monster is the category crisis itself, but the point is essentially the same. Monsters emerge from the spaces outside of our categories. And that brings us to Cohen's fourth thesis. The monster dwells at the gates of difference. For Western cultures in particular, there is difference that matters and difference that does not. We have chosen sex, gender, and race, and now politics, as differences that matter. And we use index features like clothing, hair, skin, color, and speech as markers for these differences. We could have marked many other differences, such as height, voice, smell, movement, or even geography. But we chose the former as differences that matter most. Such marking of difference based on index features is the first step in making a monster because it creates the category of other. As we have already seen, our rage for order never allows the other to be merely other. It must always be diminished and even made dangerous. When the other is unthreatening, that is, when it stays in its place in the order of things, it may remain as an unequal but integral element of the system. Cultural theorists call this a subaltern, which is a military term meaning of lower rank. Should the subaltern move out of her place in the order of things, such as in demanding more rights than she's been afforded by the existing order, and if she has some power in that move, such as gathering other subalterns or gaining a voice that is increasingly heard, she may be deemed monstrous. The classic case here from the ancient world is Lilith, Adam's first wife, according to the Talmud. For her full story, I refer you to the lecture here on our channel by Aaron Henne, director of Theater Dybbuk. He provides a broad historical context for this figure and some wonderful insights into her monstrous creation and regular revisitations. The short version of her story is that she wanted Adam to lie on the ground during sex while she took the dominant position. Here is a part of the entry on Lilith in the Encyclopedia of Jewish Women. God created Lilith from the earth after the creation of Adam. They immediately began to fight over who would be on top during sexual intercourse. Lilith said, we are equal to each other inasmuch as we were both created from the earth. Lilith then pronounced God's name and flew away into the air. At Adam's request, God sent three angels to bring Lilith back, but she refused. According to one version of the tale, she told the angels that she could not return to her first husband because she had already slept with the great demon. 
She told the angels that she was created only to sicken newborn babies and that she had dominion over males until the eighth day when the boy is circumcised and over females until the twelfth day after birth. The angels then told her that they would not force her to go back to Adam as long as she agreed to leave the child alone when she saw an amulet inscribed with the angels' names and forms. Many amulets have been made against Lilith that refer to this tale. For example, Sefer Raziel contains instructions with drawings of how to make an amulet against Lilith. Even today, it is possible to purchase amulets made according to this model in Jerusalem shops that sell religious artifacts. Lilith's story is a succinct and powerful narrative of transgression and its monstrous results. Lilith would not stay in her place in the order of things, so she becomes a monster. Monsters usually arise from transgressions like Lilith's. Frankenstein's monster is born from the hubris of a scientist who thinks he can play God. Terminators come from our attempts to turn our lives and safety over to technology. And the aliens in the Aliens franchise are encountered because humans ventured too far into space and that with a craven profit motive. The monster dwells at the gates of difference, and every time we walk through those gates, we awaken it. Cohen notes insightfully that the differences that matter, sex, gender, race, etc., while remaining separate categories when the order is unthreatened, bleed together when a threat appears. The monster is hybrid because it is multiple. And multiplicity, by its very nature, is threatening to order. Lilith's transgressive sexuality turns her into a murder of innocence as well. Because she simply refuses to lie down for sex, monstrous mythology deems that she will also kill passers-by and abort unborn children. Once you transgress the order of things, you are effectively guilty of all transgressions. Such is the tenuous nature of order and the power of transgressing it. As René Girard aptly puts it in his study of the scapegoat, the threat is actually systemic and represents, quote, the potential for the system to differ from its own difference. In other words, not to be different at all, to cease to exist as a system. Difference that exists outside the system is terrifying because it reveals the truth of the system, its relativity, its fragility, and its mortality. Despite what is said around us, persecutors are never obsessed with difference, but rather by its untenable contrary, the lack of difference. Unquote. Cohen reads Girard rightly, I think, by writing the following. By revealing that difference is arbitrary and potentially free-floating, mutable rather than essential, the monster threatens to destroy not just individual members of a society, but the very cultural apparatus through which individuality is constituted and allowed. If that is the case, and I think it is, then it calls for a radical reinterpretation of power as powerlessness, or at least the fear of it. Authoritarianism and its mechanisms and discourses are generated by weakness, not strength. This observation is directly relevant to responses we see to the novel coronavirus. It is a certain order that is threatened, and the response from the fearful is to reassert the existing order to the point of incompetence, irresponsibility, and even lunacy. This phenomenon plays itself out in daily life here in the pandemic. The most powerful have the most to lose, and therefore guard the gates of difference 
with all that is available to them. We should remember that a monster appears when our stories change, and more accurately, when our stories begin to fail and the categories that they engender are threatened by events that expose the arbitrary and fragile nature of the entire schema. The new story, and thus its new schema, are threatening to be born. Monsters can be seen in this sense as the midwives in this process. Fearsome and aggressive monsters are warnings that the world and we are about to change. In mythological terms, they are threshold guardians, signaling that we are moving from one world to another, one where we do not have a map, therefore danger lies ahead. Cohen's fifth thesis is that the monster polices the borders of the possible, and he writes, Every monster is in this way a double narrative, two living stories, one that describes how the monster came to be, and another, its testimony, detailing what cultural use the monster serves. The monster of prohibition exists to demarcate the bonds that hold together that system of relations we call culture, to call horrid attention to the borders that cannot must not be crossed. Here, I think Cohen focuses too much on the double narrative he delineates, and not at all on a third one that mythologists will know, which is that the monster is ironic as well. I mean this simply in the common use of the word irony, which is saying or doing one thing and meaning the opposite. The monster's threatening prohibitions are also invitations. The monster represents our fear of impending change, but change happens regardless. So the monster can be seen as an agent of change, a portal even. For example, the serpent in the Genesis myth questions the single boundary that the Lord God lays down in the garden. There's just this one tree that is outside the schema. Everything else is there for the first human's pleasure. The serpent induces the couple to transgress the only boundary, and the punishment of death eventually comes, but the promise of knowledge is immediately fulfilled. Then the Lord God said, See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. The monster not only advanced the story, it also made the story of humanity possible by forcing us out of a garden where nothing ever happened into a world that would tell this very story of its origin. In its monstrous form as a symbol, COVID-19 is an invitation to know, to change, to add to our story on earth. The monster polices the borders of the possible and both warnings and invitations are appropriate in the liminal zone. The first thesis was that the monster's body is a cultural body where the emphasis is on culture. And now we can focus on a corollary to that thesis, which is that the monster has a body. Perhaps there are monsters without a body or some corporeal element if so, they are rare. For example, there was a great, terrible movie in the 70s called The Fog, but the monsters still had a physical existence in the story world. To serve their function as lightning rods for uncertainty, it helps for monsters to be symbolic objects rather than concepts, though concepts are embodied there, as we have seen. Further, since the monsters are ultimately us, we need to see ourselves in them, which means that they need anthropomorphic features. Our best monsters are quasi-human and produce a feeling of both recognition and repulsion. 
what Freud called the uncanny. With their anthropomorphism, monsters enter the web of fear, hatred, and other human-to-human -human interactions. Among these is desire. And this is perhaps Cohen's most fascinating thesis. Fear of the monster is really a kind of desire. Again, the serpent in the garden is an excellent illustration. We need not do a Freudian reading of the phallic symbolism of the serpent to see the effects of Cohen's sixth thesis here. The Lord God himself created the context for monstrous desire by endowing his creation with abundance, leaving his creatures unclothed, placing a single prohibition on them, and having a serpent there and to seduce them into a transgression that leaves them full of the knowledge of the gods, not to mention the knowledge that they had been naked. The text of Genesis reveals itself that fear of the monster is really a kind of desire. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight for the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. The woman saw before her eyes were opened. She delighted before she ate. She desired wisdom before she became knowledgeable. Here Cohen explores my addition to his previous thesis, namely that in warning, the monster also invites, or as he puts it, attracts. The same creatures who terrify and interdict can evoke potent escapist fantasies. The linking of monstrosity with the forbidden makes the monster all the more appealing as a temporary egress from constraint this simultaneous repulsion and attraction at the core of the monster's composition accounts greatly for its continued cultural popularity. For the fact that the monster seldom can be contained in a simple binary dialectic, thesis, antithesis, no synthesis, we distrust and loathe the monster at the same time we envy its freedom and perhaps its sublime despair. Cohen is very good on this point, so let me let you hear his voice again. Through the body of the monster, fantasies of aggression, domination, and inversion are allowed safe expression in a clearly delimited and permanently liminal space. Escapist delight gives way to horror only when the monster threatens to overstep these boundaries, to destroy or deconstruct the thin walls of category and culture. This is why we love our monsters. They give us permission to enter imaginative spaces that the existing order does not allow. We can sit in a darkened theater or living room and see a world unconstrained by the existing order without having to deal with the actual consequences of aliens, vampires, terminators, and zombies. 
For example, I am convinced that part of the attraction of the walking dead is that it allows us to experience a world in which we can kill other human beings with complete justification. That is, they are not actually human beings. It is a thin line between a zombie and a human, which is the tension that drives every zombie story. At the same time, as Cohen puts it, we envy the monster's sublime despair. And why would we not? Anytime we feel outside the order of things, or that a dominant story does not fit our lives, we encounter such sublime despair. And this is the making of art and of monsters. Let us recognize that the fear engendered by the pandemic is also a kind of desire, if only because it is an opening in a closed system. The monster threatens to destroy our current system and any desire for the new that has been prohibited by that system is now free to be expressed through the monster's body, which again is made of symbols, but anthropomorphic ones. In fact, Western culture writes itself on the bodies of its subjects, especially its others. So the monster represents freedom from that corporeal scripting. The monster's body is itself hybridity, multiplicity, and forbidden desire, all elements of life prohibited or proscribed by the existing story or schema. As Cohen notes, the monster serves as a kind of alter ego, allowing the constrained subject freedom to explore the chaos of the post-monster destruction. Artists and shamans know this world well, the one outside of categories in the dominant story, and they seek to bring it into the existing world through esoteric symbolism, paradox, and double meanings. We might invoke one of Dostoevsky's characters from the Brothers Karamazov to help us with this concept. Ivan floats the idea that without God, everything is permitted. Years of Christian apologists have borrowed this phrase to warn us of the dangers of not believing in God. But in terms of monster theory, Ivan is exactly right, albeit in a different way. Without God, everything is permitted, and we are free. That idea is an analog to the tree in the garden. The, pro the prohibition against eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was a limitation on our knowledge and especially our freedom. A world in which everything is permitted is a world desired by many of us from childhood to old age. We look into this world when we watch toddlers roam in the garden of youth, naked, unashamed, and unencumbered by the prohibitions we attempt to place on them. This is also the world of the monster who is unencumbered by culture what Freud called our discontent with civilization. Even more concretely, when the Hunt Linux map included the phrase, here be dragons, or here be lions on the ancient Roman maps, it is both a warning and an invitation. Obviously, we did not heed the warnings on those maps, and we freely crossed those thresholds into, quote, new worlds, unquote. And sure enough, for those who entered the monstrous portal and crossed the threshold, the world they found there was replete with a perceived and projected licentiousness. There was no God and everything was permitted. Here, for example, the namesake of the Americas, Amerigo Vespucci, in a pamphlet that was widely circulated in Europe about the people he encountered on the other side of the monster. The women, as I have said, go about naked and are very libidinous, yet they have bodies which are tolerably beautiful and cleanly, nor are they so unsightly as one perchance might imagine, for 
Inasmuch as they are plump, their ugliness is the less apparent, which indeed is for the most part concealed by the excellence of their bodily structure. It was to us a matter of astonishment that none was to be seen among them who had a flabby breast, and those who had borne children were not to be distinguished from virgins by the shape and shrinking of the womb. And in other parts of the body, similar things were seen, of which in the interest of modesty, I make no mention. When they had the opportunity of copulating with us Christians, urged by excessive lust, they defiled and prostituted themselves. They live 150 years and rarely fall ill, and if they do fall victims to any disease, they cure themselves with certain roots and herbs. These are the most noteworthy things I know about them. Dracula himself and the vampires he inspires seduce those within the old story the old schema, and promise not only sexual experiences out of this world, but eternal life itself. Fear of the monster is really a kind of desire. Cohen's final thesis is that the monster stands at the threshold of becoming. And his analysis is a single paragraph that is worth you hearing in his own voice. Monsters are our children. They can be pushed to the farthest margins of geography and discourse, hidden away at the edges of the world and in the forbidden recesses of our mind, but they always return. And when they come back, they bring not just a fuller knowledge of our place in history and the history of knowing our place, but they bear self-knowledge, human knowledge, and a discourse all the more sacred as it arises from the outside. These monsters ask us how we perceive the world and how we have misrepresented what we have attempted to place. They ask us to reevaluate our cultural assumptions about race, gender, sexuality, our perception of difference our tolerance toward its expression. They ask us why we have created them. This brilliant and beautifully rendered conclusion makes the journey through monster theory well worth the trip. The symbols and stories surrounding COVID-19 are configuring themselves into a monster story by those who stand to lose from stories changing in power disappearing. The virus itself is microscopic and deadly, which creates one experience for those suffering from it and those attending to them, but it will eventually be reined in and made innocuous. For the rest of us, COVID-19 is a monster roaming freely and recklessly throughout the world of culture. Its fearsomeness is its utter disregard for the stories we have been telling ourselves and the categories by which we have ordered the world. Like all monsters, it represents chaos. It seeks only to steal life from other life, replicating itself with what appears to us as ferocious intensity. But to the virus, it is simply being what it is. Nothing is quite as terrifying as a monster that not only disregards the meanings we have made, but also steals our very life in order to survive. Of course, we humans do that regularly with other life. So it is no strange thing in the wider world. In fact, it is the nature of our world. As Dolores in Westworld says, as she attempts to understand her life, this world, I, I think there may be something wrong with this world, something hiding underneath. Either that or there's something wrong with me. I may be losing my mind. As your name suggests, dear Dolores, it is both, and your sorrow and distress are well-founded. 
For those humans who have a story that places them in a web of relation, death is the way of all life, and we must all take our turn, since we have benefited from other life that has taken its turn. For those of us who have attempted to wall off this phenomenon through certain stories and schema, and by telling ourselves a story about our own mastery of this world, changing stories and categories are a terrible tragedy that sends us scurrying to mend the tears in the fabric of our world and to rebuild the structures that have been seemingly protecting us. How should we respond to these monsters? The answer is actually fairly simple and requires no special heroism. Chill out, reflect, and recognize that monsters are symbols of change. Here are some examples of such a response from the ancient to the contemporary world. From the Tao Te Ching, have patience. Wait until the mud settles and the water is clear. Remain unmoving until the right action arises by itself. Albert Camus, sometimes carrying on, just carrying on, is the superhuman achievement. Bruce Lee, do not be assertive, but adjust to the object, and you shall find a way around or through it. And from an interview, with Fran Leibowitz in the pandemic. The New Yorker asks, how have you been spending your time in self-isolation? Leibowitz responds, it depends on how much you count the time you spend sulking. Let me put it this way, when they compile a list of the heroes of this era, I will not be on it. Mostly I've been reading, also taking phone calls from people who for the last 10 years have told me they hate to talk on the phone. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about how to think about this because it is a very startling thing to be my age, I'm 69, and to have something happen that doesn't remind you of anything else. What all of us do is use symbols to make our way in this world. We make gods and we make monsters and they return to ask us why we have created them. If we ignore the question, we remain ignorant and afraid. If we face the question, we move forward into the mystery of life, leaving behind old lives like a snake's shedded skin and re-emerging into the newness of life. As Joseph Campbell noted, this is the primary function of mythology of stories, to evoke in the individual a sense of grateful, affirmative awe before the monstrous mystery that is existence. Thank you for your attention. Be well. Mm -hmm.